Thank you. Are you a good human being? No, you can't sit on the fence about this. Are you a good human being? Are you a decent human being? I asked myself. And my hesitation in answering this question, this very simple question, woke me up. It was January 2012, January 2013. I've got to get these slides right. Okay. And a horrendous rape had occurred in New Delhi, in the city in which I grew up. A young 22-year-old medical student was coming home around 8.30 p.m. after seeing the movie Life of Pi at the Select City Mall in South New Delhi, not far from where I live. She was with a friend, a man, and she had the misfortune of needing public transportation to go home. She never got home. She was brutally gang-raped in a moving bus by six men. Her intestines were torn out, she and her friend were thrown out of the bus naked and left to die. The rape shook Delhi and the country. It shook students, parents, young men and women, but not the state, not initially. The state had to be woken up. When the middle classes turned out to protest peacefully and light candles at India Gate, the police charged them with sticks and water cannons. How can such brutality happen? How can powerful male and female, some female politicians, blame the girl for the rape? Attack her character for being out at night? She must be loose. She must be asking for it. This event took me on a questioning and writing journey that will probably last a lifetime. So today I want to address one of the questions that emerged from this period of reflection and research. Why is gender equality so difficult to achieve when each of us, wherever we see ourselves on the gender dimension, consider ourselves good and decent human beings? Why is progress so slow? Clearly all is not well when half the population in the world and therefore the other half as well, cannot live lives of dignity, fairness, and freedom. And how can we keep ignoring this fundamental inequality in chances, possibility, and freedom? There's actually not a single country in the world that has achieved gender equality. Yes, not even Sweden. Sweden has a gender wage gap at its top end, and rape statistics are high. Reported rape statistics are higher than the US and, and India. Today I'm going to use India and the US as uh, case studies, because these are the two countries I know the best. The American Declaration of Independence 240 years ago stated, all men are created equal. The preamble of the US Constitution states, we the people. The men were in charge, and to them naturally, it meant them. They were the reference point. It turns out that black people and women people were legally not considered people. It took almost another 150 years before women got the right to vote. It was the 19th Constitutional Amendment in 1920. Laws of countries reflect men's minds. Men's imagination. And public policy and public rules, regulations reflect deep-seated culture. And this uh, cultural drag operates even today. And it's reflected in statistics. So let's look at one statistic in the US, which is the gender wage gap. In 1960, in the US, 
women made 60 cents to a men's dollar. Today, women make 77 cents to a men's dollar, and that progress has stalled. The improvement has been approximately 0.3 cents a year. So the current estimate is that it will take a century for women to be paid the same amount as men for the same work. And this is in the USA. The Equal Wage Act was passed in 1963. USA ranks uh, 20th in the Gender Gap Index of the World Economic Forum and India 114. India enshrined uh, in equality based on gender in its constitution at independence. But like the US, the cultural drag is intense. Dowry was outlawed in 1961, but weddings become more lavish every year. In fact, the, because of dowry, there's now a one dowry death in India. Women are killed because they didn't bring enough gifts to the family. One woman is killed every hour. Again, culture uh, triumphs or trumps uh, law. The anti-dowry bill was passed in 1961. Let's look at women working outside homes, uh, the women's labor participation rates. In the US, that percentage is now 69%. In India today, the labor, fo labor force participation rate is 29%, which is, low, which is about the same as it was in the US in 1948. But in India today, like elsewhere, remain invisible. The India of today is actually very different from the, from the US of 1948. There are uh, over a billion people, and technology has changed everything. There are almost a billion cell phones in India today. In Delhi, the capital, 88% of homes own TV, and India overtakes the US in terms of the number of homes that own digital TV. So hard porn is downloadable on the phone and is available to men living in remote corners of India who may still be using bullock carts to plow the land and is equally available to legislators in uh, state and national assemblies. India's population of 1.2 billion is four times the population of the US in a country one-third the size. So how long will it take India to achieve a life of equity and dignity for over 500 million girls and women in India today? So this last year, over the last year, in a research project that I'm doing, we interviewed over 500 women and girls, uh, primarily from the middle class in Delhi as well as other cities. And based on this research, I conclude that better education, better health, and better income are necessary but not sufficient conditions to achieve gender e equity. So the question is, how can we learn from the experiences and how can we speed up change? So I'll focus primarily on India and the US. The first condition for change is dignity. Indignity is safety. Safety even in peacetime. India, by no stretch of imagination, is a country at war. Yet its women live in a war zone. And they are subject to mass trauma daily on the streets and even in their homes. And this is not a metaphor. This is reality. In a recent UN and Jagori, which is an NGO survey in Delhi, 95% of women said they feel unsafe in public spaces. 95%, that is just about every woman and girl feels unsafe. And 73% said they feel unsafe in their daily surroundings, which includes their homes. Our study was not about violence or rape, uh, it was basically un to understand from both women and men 
what does it mean to be a woman today and what does it mean to be a man today in India's today? And when we started talking to women, it was, it was literally as if a dam broke. As it turns out, about between 80 to 90% of women said that they had been molested, harassed, terrorized on the streets, in marketplaces, in places of worship, in public transportation, in buses, and in metros. Public transport, uh, transportation particularly is a, a nightmare, even in Delhi's pride, its new shining metro, uh, um, yeah. Neeti, who is 20 years old, says Eve teasing is a regular practice in the metro. Uh, and, and now I quote her. I used to come home from work at 8.30 at night, and I used to get in, and the majority of people around me were men. You were being touched from alag alag angles, meaning from different angles. You shout for one or two days, and after a point, you are in a situation where you are being touched from all sides and you can't do anything about it. I used to cry a lot. Just like an animal experiment, the rats who can't escape the electric shocks after a while just stop trying and just lay there even when the shocks are no longer happening. Psychologists call this learned helplessness. Geetika, also from an upper middle class family who's 20 years old, said, most times I ignore Nine times out of ten, I ignore. I feel angry, but I do not react. Reshu, who's 23, said her life is run by the thought of not becoming a target on the streets of Delhi. She said, I'm always on alert, constantly scanning to see where will I be attacked from. For her, every day going out of the home is guerrilla warfare. I don't want to give you rape statistics. I have them, and you can look them up as well. It seems to be morally wrong in arguing which country has more rapes in women. I know men get raped as well. We shouldn't engage in another race to the bottom. Let me just say that India is not the rape capital of the world. The rape statistics based on the population are much higher in many countries in the Western world, including the USA, including Sweden, including the UK. This may come as a shock. Again, check them out. When you talk about rape and molestation in our study, and this reflects the overall statistics, just one woman spoke about rape by strangers. And this was a young 25-year-old, highly educated, uh, from Jawaharlal Nehru University. One of the questions we had, uh, had very early on is, what are the three words you associate with being a woman? And she used the word struggle. And we didn't ask her anything about violence. And she started talking about her rape when she was, ra she was 13 years old when she was raped. And she said what hurt her the most was that nobody came to my birthday the next day. The rape happened as she was coming home from inviting her friends. She said, the cops ate my cake, and I hated that the most. And since then, I have not celebrated my birthday. The cops, instead of telling my parents to take steps, they discouraged it. They said, don't do it. The reputation of your daughter will get spoiled. Aapki beti ka naam kharab ho jayega. And again, this is not just in India. It's exactly the same happening in the USA. So after a man commits a crime, it's a woman who has to worry about her reputation. In India, as in other countries, 90% of rapes and molestations occur not by strangers outside, but behind doors, behind closed doors, by family, by neighbors, by friends, by doctors, by chemists, people that are trusted by little girls. What is even more frightening, and but is real and is true, but we just don't talk about it, is that 99% of the girls who had been touched inappropriately did not tell their parents. 99% of the girls did not tell, not even the mother. And when they did tell their mothers, the mothers share said, be quiet. Don't tell anyone. And if they didn't, they said that. And in addition, the suspicion was, what did you do to attract this attention?
So the women kept quiet. The girls kept quiet. So the question that I want to raise is when women are raped or girls are raped in public places, there's an outcry. But when girls or women are raped by those they know behind closed doors, the response is more tentative, cautious, and muddled. Both in the US and in India, it's considered private. In India, marital rape was not included in recent rape law because it would, within quotes, destroy the family. What kind of a family are we talking about from a woman's perspective or a girl's perspective? So since I'm talking to the uh, group hosted by the Institute of Public Policy, I think one of the key notions that we have to uh, examine is our notions of what's public and what's private. Let's look at education. I think our thinking about education also contributes to very, very slow change in gender equity. I think we all would agree that it's important for girls and boys to go to school. In fact, India has, fund, uh, has correctly, we now have a rule or uh, the Right to Education Act which passed in 2010. I want to raise uh, three issues around education. The first is uh, around the oppressor. Who is the oppressor? It seems to me that we seem to care more about who is the oppressor rather than the oppression, the act of oppression and the outcome of oppression. When we take the Taliban, and the Taliban tries to stop and stops girls from going to school, there's an international outcry. The villain is clear, the force used is extreme, it's external, and overnight the government is pressured to build more schools and enrollments go up, and that's important. But when 64 million girls are stopped from going to school, primary school in India, there's no outcry. Why is that? 64 million girls, because our notions of when to intervene are governed by who is the oppressor and not the act of oppression. The stopping of girls in this case is by millions of fathers and mothers. It's private, it's diffuse. The parents do not constitute an identifiable organization, but the parents don't see the values of educating girls. Girls are needed at home. The second is, I would say in is educational practice, which is in development strategy, there's much that's going well, but there seems to be an over-obsession with access. That basically means physical infrastructure. Is the physical infrastructure present? Physical things are easy to count, build, and they will come. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But what if the physical things, like schools, or water supply, or toilets, or buses, don't function effectively? What if they're not used? What if they become centers of oppression? What if after spending years in school, as happens in government schools in India, children still can't read or write? Uh, what if 25% of teachers are absent at any time? And what if 50% of those who are present aren't actually teaching? It's much easier to build things than to make them function. And development incrementalism doesn't work. It destroys because it destroys belief and trust in systems and keeps old systems uh, of power in place. I think education is also a cultural process. And education might actually reinforce stereotypes. What if a highly educated woman or man, what if you're highly educated and you still don't have voice? What if you're still afraid to speak up? So education today does not equal voice. In the study that I'm doing, that I'm just completing, there were many shocks. And I would meet smart young women dressed very much like many of you here. And we would invariably meet in coffee shops. And within a few minutes, the stories would come start tumbling out. And they, would, couldn't they couldn't stop talking. And yet their biggest problem in life was they could not talk. They would not speak up. So after all their degrees and the disposable income that the private sector loves, 
women's inner scripts is still the same as previous generations. Some things have changed, obviously, but the confusion is worse because now the expectation is that they will get educated and they will work outside their homes and that they will be able to speak up, argue, and hold their own at work. A 32-year-old Neera said, I was always told to keep quiet, even if something is doing something wrong to me. Anisha, who's 32, said, I keep my words inside myself. Namrata, who's 24, said, my mom's strategy for conflict resolution is two words, keep quiet. She said, I've learned to become invisible, as invisible as possible. She said, I don't trust my voice. If you don't trust your voice, you're not going to speak up. And these are not illiterate women. These are the 5%, the top 5% of India. These are the big city educated women. And just before you dismiss this as peculiar to India, let's turn to look at the US. If there hadn't been a serious problem of gender inequality, of women holding back despite education, health, and income, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, would have been a dud rather than an international bestseller. Sheryl Sandberg's book, and you can criticize it all you want, but basically she asks women to assert themselves, to make suggestions, to ask for salary increases. And lots of other research shows that women are more likely to judge themselves not qualified for a job than a man. Women don't speak up in boardrooms and meetings when they are in the minority, which is most of the time because men are in the majority in senior levels. Uh, in the US, only 4% of Fortune 500 companies are women. Women are more likely to say that they have a job or position because they're lucky. Men are more likely to say it's because they're smart. Let's go to, I'm not very good at keeping up with the slides, clearly. I should have given this job to somebody else. Let's go to HBS. I don't know if you know about this, but HBS, as you know, Harvard Business School is considered one the le elite or the leading business school in the world. And in 2012, they started a gender experiment in which they had to give women voice lessons lessons in how to raise their hands in confidence in classrooms and keep them raised. They had to teach, retrain uh, women faculty who were, getting cons who were consistently getting low ratings how to change how they were teaching. As a result of this, within two years, they saw dramatic shifts. Women started emerging as leaders. Students started emerging as leaders and junior faculty's performance which went up so high that they thought they'd made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And basically what they found was that female, junior female faculty were either too lenient or too harsh. And so they were basically coached right after each class on how to be firm and warm. So what are the lessons uh, for achieving uh, gender equality? I'm gonna focus on three. First is incrementalism. Let's look at incrementalism versus people first, or client first, or citizen first. Let's consider the spread of any restaurant change. And my apologies for using McDonald's as the uh, example, but it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for thinking not about McDonald's, but the approach. The approach in uh, having something spread. When McDonald's builds a restaurant in India, right now they have 300, they open a, they open a restaurant, they op rent a building, or they build a building, they get all the equipment, they do all the research, they come up with products that people like, they don't discriminate who comes in and who, comes, who, who goes out, they treat people well, they smile and they greet you, and it's all together, it's not sequential. They watch and monitor, and if they notice some groups of people are not coming in, they investigate and they change quickly, and then they spread. They don't build shells 
and incrementally change. They don't get lettuce one day and potatoes the next day. They don't get fryers working one day and the workers not coming the next day. They do it all together. And once they figured out the solution and it works well, they spread. And they spread with everything in place. Let's look at schools. You build a school, and I'm talking about government schools. They may not have books. They may not have teachers. They may not have girls coming. Then they force girls to come, and girls start coming. Then girls are treated poorly, and they stop coming. And the teachers don't show up, and the teachers don't teach. And nobody notices or scares, and it's 20 years later. Then they realize girls have periods, and they need toilets. So toilets are built. Then it takes another 20 years before you realize the toilets aren't working, and we've lost two generations. So by the time the kids get to fifth grade, they're not even reading at the second grade level. And 45%, which is half, half the girls, have dropped out. And the low class, the low caste children, are treated so badly that they've stopped coming to school. Does this mean you stop funding? No, absolutely not. It means don't res whatever resources you have, don't spread them thin. Don't go into every country and try and do everything. Change takes time. Do something and do it well so it sticks and changes systems before you try and take on yet another problem. And right from the beginning, we have to design for final outcomes. So working backwards. The second issue that I want to talk about is change we need is how do we actually view gender norms or gender equity? Is it a private good or is it a public good? Focus, uh, development tends to focus on individuals, and this is wrong-headed. This may be a Western bias. It may be an econ economics bias. And so it's led us to believe that gender equity is a private good. It's not. Why? Because we're social animals. We live together and we change together. Uh, research shows that beliefs of communities and families are key determinants of individual behavior. So gender norms are not just a private, private belief. And this has been established by very large scale qualitative and quantitative studies. Gender norms are like the air. They are everywhere and they travel. And gender inequity travels and permeates the world. So treating gender inequity as a local good is like trying to clean up the ocean or the air one square inch at a time. Especially in this digitalized, globalized world of instant access across national boundaries, because no government can actually stop YouTube or films or soap operas from the US or Sweden penetrating the rest of the world. The norms of holding women as less valuable, this, by the way, is a very recent ad. The norms of holding women less valuable than men means that everything that's associated with women becomes automatically less valued. Whether it's raising children or looking after parents or jobs associated with women, it's universal, it's not Indian or it's not an American problem. It's not a village problem, it's not a city problem. And even economic incentives to increase girls' value has perverse effects when the overall context of equity, inequity pervades. And you see this in girls' scholarship, giving scholarships to girls in schools, or opening accounts that girls get when they're 18 years old. This has increased enrollment, but in an overall climate of inequity, the question that's asked now before marriage is not, is the girl educated, but is the girl, does the girl have a scholarship account? And is that account transferred to the man's name. So in an overall climate, in, in inequitable climate, just about everything gets pervert, perverted. So we've been fooled into think, thinking that gender norms are private. They're not. It's a public good. It's not even a local business. It's global business. And we need to take action at the global level, just like for climate change. The third issue, fine way of thinking is, I'd summarize it as, as economics versus culture. Culture meaning habits of the mind or the inner scripts. The central assumption in economics is rationality of individuals. 
But psychologists, including, including Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, shows that this basic assumption is flawed. It's given rise to behavioral economics. 90%, about 90% of our decisions are based on automatic and are not deliberate. They are based on our previous habits, which are guided by memory, by metaphor, by intuition, by images. And this is true for the poor, the middle class, the rich, for think tanks, for the UN, for the World Bank. When we have beliefs, facts don't change our beliefs very often. We have a belief and we selectively use facts to rationalize our beliefs. Experiments at Max Planck Institute using brain scans show that our brains have already made a decision seven seconds before we are conscious of it. So what are we talking about when we say we've thought about our decision? Research also shows that to make deliberate decisions is very exhausting, and so we are tired and lazy, <laughs> and so we go on automatic. One of the most fascinating pieces of research was looking at parole decisions made by judges. And the single most important, the only predictor they had of whether a, a prisoner got parole was the time of day when the decision was made. Why was that? Because when judges are tired, they don't want to take a risk. So the best time for you to have an important meeting is first thing in the morning or right after lunch. Don't have meetings right before lunch, important meetings right before lunch or in, at the end of the day. They won't go in your favor. <laughs> so let's look at supply and demand. <clears throat> Economic theory predicts when a good is scarce and valued, the price goes up, right? If you think about oil, but if you think about women in India, there are fewer women than men in India as well as in China. So when there are fewer women, the theory of supply and demand would say that the price of women go girls goes up, there's more dowry, and women are at a higher, higher bargaining power, negotiating power than men. Actually, that doesn't happen. In the areas where there are the fewest women, because the dominant culture is of a very ma macho masculinity, what is happening is that brothers are sharing a woman, there is greater trafficking of women, and there is greater prostitution. So it's not necessary that women will become more valued because they are more scarce. China has the most skewed sex ratio in the world, and women, Chinese women are not running either the Communist Party or industry. So the climate, the gender of climate change is really important. Let me just take one more example of the <coughs> importance of cultural belief. The, in the US, the central belief is that if you work hard, you can be anybody, right? You can rise. This cultural belief is embedded in American DNA and it's allowed inequality to reach obscene levels. Because voters vote against their own self-interest because if there are any gap, caps on salaries or if there's greater taxation on the rich, people believe they're voting against their own potential. And a recent Pew Research showed that 65% believe that inequality is increasing, but they also believe, still believe that they have a shot in getting rich. So. So it's important to not, not ignore culture, but culture can be broken down into habits. When Harvard Business School owned that they had a gender problem, they, their gender experiment did make major changes. But they realized they can only clean up their one square inch of gender inequity, the cultural milieu but that these women and men still have to go out into a bigger world, which then leads to wage gaps. Women's wages, when they go out, at within nine to 10 years, there is a $200,000 on average difference between girls' wages and women's wages, graduates from HBS and other elite business schools. So I feel very strongly now that the culture of gen gender equality or gender inequality is like human climate, it's everywhere. It's like the air and ocean. It's a global public good, it's a transnational good, it's a transboundary go good to which the whole world needs to commit and put its genius behind. 
The SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, have a very bold vision. They have goals to clean up oceans, the air, to show, slow down climate change. The vision is to create at least a billion, $100 billion fund for climate change. It's the actually climate change is the only goal that's considered urgent, that uses the word urgent. I feel we have to clean up the gender climate, which affects each and every one of us today, not tomorrow. Both men and both women, and I'm pleased to see that there are so many men in this room. Thank you. <laughs> Truly, I mean it. Gender the gender issue, the gender inequality issue cannot be tackled by women alone. It needs a very, very strong alliance between men and women. It needs an algo type together with a woman to lead, lead this movement across the world. Although the change can be initiated and it can be seeded anywhere, including right here. Finally, there's no room for moral superiority in this arena. We're all creatures of our culture. And most of us are biased against women because we learn this very early in our homes. I'd encourage each and every one of you to do the implicit association test online. It's on the Harvard University website. Do the gender association test. It's sobering. <coughs> I did it. As a woman, I emerged biased against women. So I'm biased against myself. So what can we do as biased, decent, cultural creatures, both men and women? I think it's really important to get clear on your values, on our values, on our cultural values, and live by them, question them. And always ask why. See things in new ways. And speak up. It's easy to speak up when we are surrounded by others like ourselves, men and women. But it's an act of courage when you speak up alone. So don't be a part of the silent majority. You have to speak up. And you must speak up till you're heard. Speak up. Thank you.